Hey everyone, if you took the AP uh, English language exam in 2022, you're in the right place. Even if you didn't take it, you want us to give you a good overview of what we saw in the 2022 AP English language exam, then welcome. Let me know in the chat or in the comments of this video, if you're watching the recording, what questions you have, what challenges you faced, um, what things left you scratching your head. There was a few things about this exam this year that were interesting to say the least. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. My name is John from Marco Learning. I um, have really enjoyed talking to a lot of you through this whole AP exam season. We provide support in about 15 AP subjects here at Marco Learning. So definitely subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Um, and let me know whether you have any questions or um, ways that I can specifically help you. So this PDF has been released by the College Board. You are allowed to talk about it. And I'm just going to type in PDF here in the chat um, and make sure that you can all um, access this directly. I've also linked to it and pinned it in the top of the chat and in the description of this video. So here it is, the free response part of the exam, the multiple choice part of the exam, we cannot really see. Um, they're not releasing it. They always release the free response questions about 48 hours after the exam. And then later in the summer, after the reading is complete, we're gonna get a breakdown of how people scored. We're gonna get student samples, chief reader reports, all sorts of things that are gonna help us. Let's get right into the first task you had. This is the synthesis task. Um, and I think that it's it's an interesting topic um, that's relevant to everyday life. What should we do as a civilization about science and technology, and engineering and mathematics in our education system? How do we balance that with other priorities? But there was a little tricky thing about this. And so what you get, I'm not going to read it out loud to you, but I'll just say this opening paragraph of the synthesis task is asking you to think about that nuanced debate, that discussion going on about the value of science, technology, engineering, and math as a priority. But then the question is very specific. It says, your task, you need to write an essay, okay, that's easy, that synthesizes material from at least three of the sources. That's that standard, stable, prompt wording. And develops your position on the value, if any, of initiatives to improve STEM education and increase the number of students interested in the STEM disciplines. Notice what this is not saying. Do you like STEM education? Is STEM education a good thing? It's a more complicated question. Should we put money into programs that improve STEM education, just make it better, and increase the headcount? We get more humans doing STEM majors, STEM courses, more kids electing to sign up for AP Computer Science, who want to major in engineering, who want to become a technology, chief technology officer. Is that what we should be focusing on? So you see that it's like many things that are college level for an AP exam. It's supposed to be this kind of sophisticated. So, um, and this is real quick. I'm just taking a look at the chat. Um, great commentary here. Yeah, the, Matthew, you're saying the synthesis is easy and fun. Let me know in the chat, how would you describe your journey with this synthesis prompt? Did you find it easy, exciting to write about? Like people got opinions about whether they should have to take AP English language or take four years of history versus three, or should, you know, here's a question, should the state that you live in require every high school student to take four years of computer science education? Um, and so your job is to enter into that uh, conversation. You can, uh, by the way, in this um, chat, thank you, go, see you later, people going to see the suns, um, you can put in, you know, kind of how you responded to these things, it's that's perfectly fair game. Um, so uh, again, I encourage you through this chat, let me know kind of what your experience was. So we will not spend our short stream here going through each one of these sources, but you'll see that the sources add, there's two kind of graphical sources and four textual sources they added a lot of nuance, you know, even just look at the title of Alexandra Osola's article from the Atlantic, is the US focusing too much on STEM? It seems obvious, a lot of people like really wanna value science education, but are we going too far? And then this describes some of the recent changes that are going on. Here we get a nice chart. I always like these and kind of park myself on this. Let's break it down. It's from the government. It's called Science, Technology, Engineering, Math, Education for Global Leadership. It's a 2010 report published by our government, projected percentage increases. So this was 
now in the past, but was then a future projection of where we would see increases in STEM jobs. And we're seeing quite clearly, people are gonna be doing a lot in the biomedical engineering side. You can see major growth, a good amount in system software and medical scientists, but in all occupations, and I'm, I don't know, it's a little unclear whether it's all occupations like STEM jobs or all occupations beyond that. It's an ambiguity of this graph, at least at first, first glance. Um, but we're definitely seeing certain fields are seeing really explosive growth or they're expecting it that would justify investing more in education. Um, so again, you wanna think about this is your goal in the synthesis essay is to enter into the conversation it's a nuanced conversation. It is not STEM good, humanities bad, or humanities good, STEM bad. We need them all. Question is, should we invest in, let's go back to that wording. I want you to be obsessed with the wording of questions. Should we invest in initiatives to improve education and or increase the number of students interested in STEM disciplines. Is that where we should be focusing our attention? Uh, and I think it's a fascinating question. And again, a nuanced one. Hopefully your essay reflected the sensitivity and complexity of this topic. The fact that it's not black and white, yes, no, good, bad. Um, and here we get STEM education is vital, but not at the expense of humanity. So source C in the Scientific American and a publication written by a bunch of scientists and science journalists is saying, hey, don't cut off the humanities. And we see actually in this source, um, a really vivid example of this. What are, it's a survey of employer priorities. Employees value some skills and qualities more than others. And look at the very first thing that employers care about the most ethical judgment and integrity. And I love science, but there's nothing in the scientific method about ethics. I love science, but there's nothing and there's nothing in engineering as a discipline that it necessarily enriches one's understanding of integrity. You can bring a concept of integrity from outside of the scientific method or mathematical rules and apply it within the discipline. And there's a whole ethics to engineering, but engineering is not generative of its own um, ethical insights that that, that are kind of informing all disciplines. So it's a very fancy way of saying, if you wanna get ethical judgment and integrity, you might have to go outside of your math textbook, right? Comfortable working with colleagues, customers, the social skills, we call them soft skills, they matter, right? Um, and so this goes on through the other sources. I wanna go to the next task that you have. Our stream here is pretty brief tonight. Um, and I wanna take you to, to the number two. So the summary, the headline for synthesis is a topic we all know about, a topic that kind of sets you up to be like STEM or not, but then gets into a very specific idea of, okay, is it, um, to what extent should we be investing in initiatives that improve STEM education or increase the number of, and increase the number of STEM students? And that is something you wanted to develop your position on. Um, and I'm seeing a few things in the chat here, by the way. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so some of you, and that's, a, that's an interesting point Hayden's making about being part of a STEM academy. Some of you are like inherently, this is a very personal topic right away. Um, and Isabel saying, can I say we should improve STEM education and the number of students because of the high demand of STEM related jobs? Yes, that's a, that's a key justification. They actually laid that out within the prompt. Now let's look at prompt number two. This was um, exciting to put a spotlight on the first Latina justice of the US Supreme Court, Sonia Sotomayor, who delivered a speech. Now, one thing I wanna, I wanna zoom in on here, literally I'm zooming, is on the rhetorical occasion. Remember a rhetorical occasion, a rhetorical situation is who is this human talking to other humans? And like, wh why are they all together? And we know who this human is. Her name is Sonia Sotomayor. She is not yet a Supreme Court justice. This is a 2001 speech, So, but she is an appeals court judge. She is a prominent judge in America. Who is she speaking to? Graduates, right? Um, or no, not graduates. Does it say graduation? No, you wanna pay attention. It's a speech at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. So it's to students. She's speaking to students who are in law school, who are in that same profession that she's in. She is a judge. So that's who she is. That's who they are. What is the room? Some room at the University of, of California Berkeley. And does that rhetorical situation 
impinge on the things that she says. And so this is a very vivid, interesting speech. She talks about being a New York and she starts immediately with where she's from and talks to the people that she's with is like, I know y'all are on the other side of the country, right? And throughout, she describes her Latin identity linked to the Puerto Rican identity of New York City, but distinct from the Mexican Americans whom she's referencing throughout. She re references Mexican Americans through the speech. And I think that's an interesting geographic reality. Puerto Rican Americans uh, tend to live more on the East Coast. Mexican Americans are more on the West Coast. And but they're all under this umbrella of Latino or Latina. And so you know, she talks about the Latina side of her identity, but defines it geographically, defines it around Puerto Rico and its particular foods and particular cultural features. So um, really interesting um, thing. Yeah, and Ava, I think this is interesting about the patriotic appeals because this is a speech that's very optimistic. Um, it concludes with this really vivid picture of kind of, um, they taught me to love being a Puerto Rican, a Puerto Rican woman, and to love America and value its lesson. What is the lesson of America? That great things could be achieved if one works hard for it. She's talking to law students who are working really hard at one of America's best public universities in the great state of California as a very distinctly New York, New Yorican woman. And so I think there's, there's, you know, her Latina side of her identity, as she calls it, there's her gender as a Latina versus the, the word Latino, her Puerto Rican identity within the Latina umbrella. And then I just, I also just love the way she used foodstuffs and imagery and sensory imagery, morcilla or morcilla, which is pig's intestine, she comes back to, right? And she talks about um, arroz, gandules y pernil, rice, beans, and pork. And you almost just feel like you're sitting at the table with her family eating piles of food. And that is just so American in this, what she calls this, um, she, she highlights as the melting pot versus the salad bowl. That as um, you know, we think of the diversity, the diversity problem in the United States, uh, the diversity challenge, the diversity opportunity is one often of um, actually, both of these are cooking analogies for um, a speech filled with, with food imagery. So I'm curious to, to ask all of you in the chat and in the comments, what specific rhetorical choices did you feature? Remember, rhetorical choices, everyone, is not necessarily devices. You don't have to say rhetorical question. You don't have to say, um, you know, that you're specifically thinking of, you know, onomatopoeia or anaphora or some sort of AP Lang word from 15 years ago, you can talk about the contrast she draws between the Mexican American experience and the Puerto Rican experience. You could talk about the, the diction she chooses. She picks up Spanish words, translates them for her audience. She knows they may not know every word. Um, references Abbott and Costello. They needed to give you all a footnote for that. Um, so I'm looking, by the way, in the in the comments here, I'm seeing uh, she's at Hayden connecting to people in America with different identities. She's speaking to a very diverse audience, presumably at, at Berkeley Law School. Um, so so yeah, and that that sense that, you know, she's another thing to think about here is she is a judge. She's a judge in the American justice system. So she says, you know, we're dealing with tensions about affirmative action or dealing with tensions of, of diversity, but railing against American policy or in any way getting specific really steps outside of what she can do as a judge. Judges are required by tradition and, and you know, to really not say, um, if, you know, for example, if an affirmative action case comes my way, here's how I'm going to vote, right? They need to, they need to take a step back, which you can watch her confirmation hearings. She did very skillfully in front of the Senate in order to earn her seat on the Supreme Court, who's had to navigate around sort of not answering a number of questions. Um, narrations um, and, and definitions, she's really going definitionally. I love the part where she contrasts what she called antiseptic um, it, where was it here? Antiseptic uh, academic discussions. Here it is, line 59. If you read it in a book, it's antiseptic. But her Latina soul, as she said, um, is described, was it right here? Um, you know, she does ask this question here. Um, 
But let me just see real quick. She, yeah, at one point she uses the word soul. So the contrast is between like antiseptic, clinical, academic language and the heart. It's really a speech from the heart and she's very good at this. Um, so let's see, appealing to emotion and tone, examples and exemplification is great. Um, the appeal to credibility, um, appeal to authority as a judge. And you know, she doesn't really talk legal stuff very much in this speech. It's about identity and personality. So um, I just wanna take a second here before I get into question three and stop with, to see if there's any questions you have about, about the synthesis essay, um, which was question one, or this rhetorical analysis essay. Your goal, of course, in the AP exam is to write as quickly as you can and under duress. Do you disagree with my analysis of either one of these? Did you see it a different way? And for shout out to all the teachers who are here or watching this, did you have your hear different things from your students about how difficult question one was or question two thing is? I feel like we all can think in terms of question one, in terms of, you know, humanities versus STEM. That's just like a thing we think about taking all the classes we take. Question two is so interesting because it's a speech by a public figure. Uh, we've seen a lot of those on recent years. I think that Sonia Sotomayor has just such a, uh, an accessible way of talking about herself and her emotions that I just really liked her and I thought it was great. So, so overall question one and question two were I think fair, um, a lot like what we're used to seeing, so to speak. Now let's talk about question three. Um, and I'll come back to the comments you guys are giving me here in the chat because there is a problem with question three. And I'm going to just read it to you. Colin Powell, a four-star general and former United States Secretary of State, wrote in his 1995 autobiography. We, now, this is the quote. Let's break it down. We do not have the luxury of collecting information indefinitely. So, okay, you can't just like keep gathering information when you're going to make a decision. Okay, I'm with him. At some point, before we can have every possible fact in hand, we have to decide. You got to make up your mind. You got to give up trying to find more information, collect more data, talk to more people. At some point, you draw the line and you have to decide. Now, here's where the quote takes a right turn. The key is not to make quick decisions, but to make timely decisions. So it's actually now two ideas that have been kind of hinged together. You can't collect information forever. Eventually, you've got to decide. Okay, that makes sense. Now we have a new distinction here, the distinction between a quick decision, got to make a decision fast, and a timely decision, which is a decision that word literally means like made at the right time. So what is, you have to make, uh, you have to write an essay that argues your position on the extent to which Powell's claim about making decisions is valid. How valid is his decision or is his claim about this? Well, his claim about decisions is that you can't have all the information all at once, okay? So eventually you have to decide. But then as you do, you make a timely decision, not a quick decision. That is tricky. Um, so there we've got, is it taking time to make good decisions, quick decisions? Yeah, I suppose it would be easier if you just said, no, don't worry about making timely decisions, make quick decisions. You've just got to be fast no matter what. Um, but I feel like, um, yeah, there's some tear. Give me an emoji for how you felt on the exam as you were staring down this quote. I want an emoji in the chat or in the comments. Like, what was your reaction? I saw someone on our TikTok. I did a TikTok about this yesterday in the Marco Learning TikTok account. And students were saying, like, I felt like I had to read the prompt five times in order to understand this. So... You know, previous years on the AP English language exam, we've seen, I think, more straightforward questions. Personally, my initial reaction as a teacher, somebody who took this exam 21 years ago, 22 years ago, and got a five on an easier open-ended question, I feel like this was not the right quote to pick. Colin Powell's an amazing author. There's many things that are great, but this particular idea is sort of a double idea. Now, remember, this is supposed to reflect college level writing um, and college level writing has these nuances and tensions. We saw this with the, ste the STEM education thing. Um, so Anna, you're saying you totally misunderstood the prompt. Some of you are saying two was harder for you. Maybe it was harder for you to dig out those rhetorical choices that Sotomayor was making. Um, and some definitely a Deshaun's got the like, arched eyebrow um, emoji. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, the other problem, of course, is that a lot of people don't budget their time correctly and they end up not having enough time for this, this question. So I'm going to put out a poll real quick, which is which question was hardest for you? And I'll put it as a poll. And so wait till I do that. This is two add option three add option. Not sure. Okay. So which of the questions, question one, the STEM question, which was the synthesis essay, uh, and I'll zoom out here. I know I'm like flying along. Um, was this the hardest question for you? Uh, the second one, which was Sonia Sotomayor's speech, Sotomayor's speech, which was the rhetorical analysis prompt, was that the hardest? Um, or, oh, sorry, I'll get all the way down here. So this is question number two. And then question number three, was that the hardest for you? Um, and if you're not sure, you can uh, select the not sure option. Here's that question three. It's weird because I feel like if I had invested the five minutes in breaking this prompt down, I'd walk away and be like, okay, I think I know what to do with the Colin Powell thing. Um, but for the other ones, you know, or, you know, I'm not sure how it works. And it looks like every, wow, almost no one picked question one. It's pretty incredible. Um, a bunch of you picked question three and some of you picked question, a, a, lot, a good chunk, almost 40% picked question two as we go through. So here's what I wanna do everyone. I wanna encourage you, First of all, if you have finished with all your AP exams, and I hope you are, congratulations, you did it. Um, and for all of you teachers, congratulations to you. We have had quite a couple of years here through AP season doing the work that we do, um, just really literally sometimes surviving until the next day. So shout out to America's AP teachers and to everyone in the trenches and schools. Um, and to all you students, you know, there's, you've, you've been through so much and we see that as your teachers, we care about you. We're glad that you, um, you made it to this point of finishing the exam. And so don't worry about your score. Scores will come out in July. Don't worry about numbers. They don't define you. Um, and if that's anything that a humanities education can teach you, it's that a human being is an infinitely valuable commodity that you matter more than what I say or what your what anyone can say about you or what any number can say. So congratulations for finishing that. If you've got questions, you're watching the recording, definitely post those in the chat or in the in the comment section. Subscribe to our channel. We have great resources available for all of you. Um, and so um, I really just want to say thank you. Thank you for the whole wonderful AP season we've had with you. Definitely be engaged with us on Instagram and TikTok and all the places we're going uh, to be posting. I'm going to be posting more analyses of free response questions on this channel. We've got AP Lit in just a minute, as well as re 